Welcome Larnell Lewis to the Stumble Forward. Larnell is an award-winning Canadian drummer, composer, producer, and educator. He may be best known for his work with the celebrated jazz fusion outfit Snarky Puppy. He's widely considered to be one of the greatest drummers in the world today. He's also risen to first name status within the musical colloquial, especially for drummers who refer to the Larnell thing or playing with a Larnell type approach. I must admit to feeling a little starstruck. Please welcome Larnell Lewis. Larnell. Yes. Hello. This is beautiful. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm excited that you're here. When I started my podcast, my real goal was to talk to drummers and comedians because those are the two things that to me are the most important aspects of my life. I spent my teenage years trying to become Dave Weckl. So, and then when I became the singer in the band, all of a sudden my drum dreams went away. So I get to live my drum dreams through you and others like you. Um, I guess we should just start quickly at the beginning. You come from a musical family. You grew up playing drums in church. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. For me, um, you know, it actually goes back to my great grandfather. Oh, as far as I know. Let's hear about that. Okay, so uh, music goes back to my great grandfather, who was a guitar player uh, from Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Then you go to my grandfather, who was in St. Kitts, and his sons, uh, one of, you know, the, my dad, all multi instrumentalists. And then moving forward to um, my Nesset family, which my brother and I are both professional musicians. My mom sings, my dad was a musical director at the church we grew up at, and my sister sings and plays a little bit of drums as well. And now my wife, uh, she's a steel pan player, and also our kids are heavily into music. Yeah, this is heavy. I mean, I feel like the church advantage is serious business. I mean, I grew up in the church, too, and was given my first opportunities to perform and sort of connect with music at such a young age that I sort of feel anybody who's really, really, really great these days often got that start in church because it gives you that sort of edge when you're young you're put into a position where you're given opportunities to play sing in front of an audience especially a loving audience and i'm 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 guessing for you you're grateful for that start as i am grateful for that start i had in church too absolutely grateful i mean you know the the piece about being in front of an audience uh for anyone who's listening or watching for a concept, you know, um, maybe your congregation might be 50 people, maybe it's about 100 people. Um, my experience grew from, you know, being in the lunchroom of a middle school f- with, you know, about maybe 70 people up until I think we got to maybe 300, almost 400 people at that church specifically. So, yeah, very big family. And so. Church. When did it become clear that this is what you were going to be doing for the rest of your life? Like, was there ever a time that that wasn't clear? Like, was that for you when you were a kid, like, I'm just setting on the track and I'm never getting off? Or how did that work? That's a really interesting question, actually. Um, For me, it started young. I told my dad, maybe when I was six, that I wanted to be a professional musician. (laughs) He said, do you know what? You don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer? You know, I said, no, professional musician. And then... He's like, okay, do you know what that means? Like, no, I just, it's a thing. I feel this thing. And uh, you go a little bit further, you know, as loving parents would say, have a backup. So, you know, I was looking to go to college for a couple of different things, but the pull for music was really strong. So I just went all the way with it. Yeah. I mean, gosh, this is where we could jump off and go a lot of places. Let's stay just a little bit in this, in these sort of early years. I've been talking a lot about dreams. Lately, I've been in a bit of a spiritual rebuild and, and, and I've been talking a lot about the fact that I may never have had a clear vision or dream, that I may have just been a talented kid who bounced from opportunity to opportunity. And, and something about the Canadian sensibility, we don't like to boast about our wants and dreams to be great. And I've kind of wondered if even the Canadian sentiment somehow challenges those of us obsessives or those who want to, to, to rise to great things to sort of keep keep our, our dreams under the sheets a little bit so as to not sort of 
make anybody around us feel uncomfortable and, and, and bring about that Canadian eye rise about, oh, you are, you know, you're thinking fairly highly of yourself. Is, is, this, is this feeling, like, can you connect to this idea? You want to go down this rabbit hole? Ah, I can, I'm happy to go down this rabbit hole. <laughs> Man, okay. Um, wow, I don't know if I've ever talked about this in this way. This is really interesting. So I would say I've not really thought about it from the perspective of, you know, living life in Canada and having that experience. Definitely grew up with a, um, a strong sense and belief and also understanding that it's important to be humble. But I also believe that um, how that translated was to constantly play down what was happening. And like you mentioned, when you bring certain things to the community, there are like, you know, a series of responses that would show up and you're kind of made to feel in certain systems as well, whether you see it or and acknowledge it right away or it kind of hits you later on in life that um, it is about the collective in some cases for those that are looking over that group of people to not be, you know, showing off, so to speak, or to allow someone another chance or let somebody get a chance because you're already going to be moving forward. So I think, I don't know, like, I, I feel like a lot of that definitely played into my history, played into my, you know, how I grew up. But a lot of it I'm, ex I'm really grateful for because what it allowed me to do was to still build but keep a perspective and understanding that we are all people with occupations. And so really keeping the understanding that when I speak to somebody, I am not my job. I am not my occupation. I am not my career. It's just a series of things that I chose to do mm. so I can maintain respect for others, but definitely could use a little more hot sauce on the talking about myself piece for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I love the humility and everything you're talking about. And I've listened to, to your, you talk in interviews before, and it's clear that, you know, your goodness shines through. I don't think that that's in question at all. Uh, also, that you are so heavily philosophical. I must say, like, it's when I was kind of researching to chat with you, I got really excited <laughs> at how philosophical you really are. And I mean, I don't know if it's your Drumeo days or that you're really having to go deep from an educational standpoint on where these concepts come from and how you derive your energies or whatever. But I mean, I feel like in some ways to be as great as you, you have to move into a philosophical space. Like I don't think you get to be at playing the game at the level you play it at without having entered into a philosophical stage with your instrument and with yourself as a musician. Am I out to lunch on this or is that about right? That's definitely right in terms of, you know, what it takes to, to, to see something that doesn't exist and just start to manifest it, right? You talk about dreams being under the sheets in terms of, um, you know, downplaying them, but dreams are things that come to you when you are still. They come to you when you're open, they come to you when you are, you know, available to them, you know? And so definitely I feel like there were moments where I was available to it or it was just very clear and I couldn't run from it, if it even if I wanted to. But I think that the way that I perform, the way that I perceive music has a lot to do with concepts. And actually a really interesting story. Um, growing up, going to church, I was at church five times a week yep. at least, you know, um, my dad being a musical director at the church, both parents becoming pastors at the church, uh, at, at another church that we ended up going to, you're in that space constantly. And so you do hear, you know, people talk a particular way and think a particular way mm -hmm. and challenge in a particular way. And so when you have from a really young age, those devices that you use to, to reason with, enter a new subject, which is music and music in the church. So now you start to feel it a particular way and communication about music in church is very different to communication in like an educational institution, mainly in my experience, because we're not using charts or we're not, you know, we're, we're, we're playing chords and people say, what's that chord again? And you play the chord and like, can you play it one more time? And they find the notes, they play each individual note or they beatbox or someone will sit on the drums. And so, 
the way that you learn about music and the way you feel music, your, your hands are on it, you know, and, and you experience it and then you communicate through it in a service and you, you know, assist the atmosphere with the music. And so I say all of that to say that, um, sometimes being philosophical is, is the only way coming out of that experience because there aren't any other words or there aren't any typical, you know, things that you would say or do. And, um, especially with my growing up, my, my experience, that's kind of what I used. I didn't have lessons for drums until a little bit later. And so I had to build something, you know, to support what it was I was doing and thinking about. So heavy, Lerno. I mean, you're just you saying uh, assist the atmosphere like blows my mind up because I mean, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about and again, we'll jump off and it's going to be circuitous. I think we're going to bounce all over the place. But I remember early on as a young drummer in Toronto, you know, in early sessions, having my sort of chopsy, my chopsy my chopsy self cut down to size by a producer that basically told me, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, but basically said, this is an acting gig. I'm not here to listen to you do your, you know, your lightning speed paradiddles between takes. I need you to come in and be the character required for this music. I don't need to hear you woodshed. I need to hear you commit to the part. How do you feel about that? I've had that too. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely had that in, um, you know, in more flowery language, yeah. <laughs> I've experienced that. And, um, you know, and it was at the high school level. And um, that's a good lesson to learn at that point. Yeah. And, and even in reference to Dave Weckl. Wow. Like, <laughs> he had a huge influence on us, you know? Oh, massive, you know? And so, um, and it was funny because that same person was actually the one that gave me um, the. Dave Weckl, sorry, the Chick Corea acoustic band record. So I was just eating that up in like grade nine or grade 10. And I come in, it's like, not the place, not the time. <laughs> so um, I, I definitely had to to learn and understand how, how to use that stuff. Because that's assisting the atmosphere in a way, like when you treat the drums as a place to, if you're an actor playing a role and I feel as a, as a session guy, and I didn't get to be the session drummer I dreamed of being as a kid, but I certainly played drums on a lot of records. And I understand that what's required is not me and how I want to play all the time. And even this, this producer who kind of humiliated me in front of a client also said something to the effect of when I had responded with my ego saying, well, it doesn't feel right. He said, it doesn't really matter how it feels. It matters how it sounds to me. I'm the producer. What you're feeling is of no consequence. What do you think about that? Ooh, I mean, there are so many ways to look at that. Uh, the first thing immediately is kind of understanding, you know, whose job is it to to steer the paid time, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because they were on the clock. Um, and then also thinking about, just what it means to be a leader as well when you are a producer and the way that you handle people. And sometimes, yeah, people don't have time to teach certain lessons. So they're like, snap into order this way. This is what it is. Um, and again, I've experienced a variety of that conversation um, from people coming at different levels. So, yeah, I think, you know, I always think there's a way to communicate things and, you know, I, I, I would feel a particular way if they were communicating it a certain way to me, but I also think going forward and being a composer, being an artist, being a producer, that you got to think about the other aspects as well. Yeah. I feel like you have, like I was listening to your first record uh, last night and mm-hmm. for a drummer, it's not a, it's not a, Hey, look at me. I'm the drummer type record. It's a beautiful fusion album. And I feel like, I mean, nobody would have been surprised or would have attempted to indict you for overplaying on your own record. So we know that there's a musical mind there that's that's controlling your overall vision. That's kind of exciting. I mean, arriving at that thing, how do you get there? Is it I mean, I know that recording yourself and listening to to yourself is a big way to leap yourself forward. And maybe, too, I want to also, as a companion piece to this question, go back to a little bit of what what you said about your job not defining you. Yet, 
You know, I lived through the sort of the 90s era of the work-life balance narrative. And I know we're still there, but you don't get to be you without there being an obsessive personality somewhere lurking beneath. Am I wrong? Oh, no, definitely. I mean, you know, that's why I play around with this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I got my things too, but... um yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned obsessive personality and, um, you know, I, I think the way that it sh hmm. We all arrive to music in a different way. And I have chosen to present my personality through music in a particular way. And sometimes it means you know, putting certain sparkly jackets away in the closet because I, I there's something, there's an effect that I would like to have overall with the presentation. Um, sometimes it's about my demeanor. Sometimes, you know, it's about my upbringing. Sometimes it's about the stories I'm telling. But every now and again, I'll, I'll, I'll break it out and, and have a good time with it. But I think that, um, yeah, kind of like tying to that little piece of, kind of what's laying under me underneath like it's it, it, the way that i chose to use my nature when it comes to locking into things and being really specific and you know looking for clarity was in the drums itself as an instrument and really being precise about how clear i am on the drums and what i'm communicating and the lessons I've learned over time uh, through the School of Hard Knocks was how to use that and desiring to be a composer so, so, so badly since I was 16 years old, 15 years old. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about that in a second. But that to me, were the, the point of that record was to blend these two worlds publicly. Mm. You know, I, I was always writing and always hearing music and always seeing these colors and seeing these things. But from the drums, it just felt like a monochromatic experience, even though I'm pushing, you know, everyone a certain way musically. And so it was a chance for me to, to lean into that. Yeah. Just hearing you talk about pushing the band to musically, like I saw you with Snarky Puppy, I believe, uh, at the Montreal Jazz Festival I don't know, five, six years ago. And mm -hmm. I mean, you are in the driver's seat and you're driving a pretty nice machine. Oh yeah. Even I went back and watched some of the skinny puppy stuff the, that there's some beautiful uh, live recordings where everybody's wearing headphones about 10 years ago. I remember when it came out and, and you know, that's why there's 12 million or 30 million views of that stuff. It's very compelling. Your playing is so precise. Um, Maybe let's just drum nerd for a bit because I will kick myself if I don't. So like I said, I was an, a, a Weckle kid and I was just telling my wife the other day, like just how Weckle influenced me. And, and, you know, I was watching Weckle from DCI videos and listening to him on electric band albums. So like the internet wasn't a thing for me and I'm pretty sure it probably wasn't for you in your early days either. Um, Dave's, the Dave Weckl sound and that approach, that cleanliness, that precision, that clarity, like he made it manifest to me that if you're not a monster at rudiments, you don't get into that place where you're expressing yourself with that kind of super clarity. So I put the kid away for a year and definitely applied myself. And when I hear what you're doing in terms of that clarity, that picture, I mean, even you're, you're, you're clearly like a great communicator, your communication ability on the drums, like, your ability to press that gas pedal and doing exactly what you want to do is incumbent upon the work you've put in all these years. Like your ability to express must know almost no limit. When I watch you play, it's like, man, this guy can imagine what's about to happen and make it happen without there's an, without an instant. And I also, again, this is not going to be a question. I apologize for taking over. I've been thinking a lot about how drums need to stay sounding rowdy alive and in the moment yet somehow you know you can watch those young drummers whose bodies take over there's this bizarre thing i've been trying to reconcile which is the brain needs to stay in control it needs to have the taste aspect of that fill or that moment or that groove but then we still as an audience want to hear that drummer 
flirt with recklessness. And there's something about that duality of the drummer being reckless and absolutely precise, knowing what they're going to play, but making it sound like it's truly improvised, creating that narrative in a fill. I mean, I could go on for days about the narrative in a fill and what a fill transmits to the listener, how important it is and how important it is to get that fill right. But we want it to feel rowdy, uh, crazy and dangerous because that's where drumming comes from. Like, I think in some ways the drummer is the showpiece of any band. And if you go to see a live experience, like that drummer is essential to so much of what we're loving about that situation. So I know there's no question in here, but maybe respond to anything you heard or just say, no, I don't feel any of what you're saying. <clears throat> that was incredible. <laughs> I've not heard it word, worded like that before. And I think it really helps to... Um, to frame, you know, the direction that we're going to go in. And, and you talk about flirting with recklessness um, and having, you know, this bombastic nature that people are really excited for. But then the mind, which also acts like a producer, has to say at some point, okay, do your little flips now, but we got to land whatever it is that we're going to do. So <laughs> sky's the limit but your body has some limits as well. And the music has some limits as well. And the listener's ear has some limits as well. Good point. And the calculation that you got to make in order to appear that way to an audience member also means that you have to watch people doing this really skillfully and you have to watch people doing this um, and crash and burn. And so you got to see what it looks like on the other side and, and build some kind of, um, some kind of a signature to the way that you get it done because mm -hmm. with every show, whether it's a cliffhanger or not, it's got to end. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. You say about you find the way you get it done. And, and this in some ways is, is my, is the, is the duality or the, in this picture of, I, I, you know, you're known like Vinny is known like Vinny. We know who we're talking about when we talk about Vinny. We know who we're talking about when we're talking about Larnell. The thing is, is that so while I said earlier that the drum gig is a, it's an acting gig, i.e. show up and don't be yourself, be somebody else. But then you arrive to a point where your voice starts to shine through in a way that people are calling you to be you. And I think that's where you're at right now. I don't think Larnell Lewis is sitting at the kit and a producer is just glibly saying on the talk back, hey, a little more Ringo. I think people are hiring you because Larnell is now a thing. There's a voice and a brand and a concept behind that philosophy that people are buying now. That's they want. You. So what is that transition from being the show up at the gig person to now I'm the person whose voice people want to hear. What what is that? Man, okay. Um, to quote a friend from an interview I heard recently, Jacob Collier. Mm. Um, Jacob mentioned that he was in a performing situation and from when they got together for the rehearsals, he was more participating because everyone's, you know, playing the song, getting into it, towards the end where everyone was now, you know, contributing. To the music and i think that for me i i loved the way that those two kind of the way that that arced because i do remember participating and you know wanting to contribute and my contribution was that when i get called on sessions i can learn songs very quickly and i can pick up on styles very quickly in terms of not only genre styles but styles of playing. So if you hired me and you said, I needed a little more Ringo or I needed a little more Weko, or I need more Dennis, you know, need a little more Brian Blade here, play soloistically. Like I, I was able to reach into my bag and that's what I was able to, you know, contribute to the situation, which was these, um, my ability to, to mimic to a degree. After a while, I ended up entering into situations where I was contributing. So I was giving of myself. I was you know, in there with my hands molding the music and, you know, really affecting things. And I think part of it was, you know, coming of age. I think people after a while started to see me more as, um, a, like hear me more as a very specific sound. Um, part of that was from recording quite a bit with a lot of people. And then once I gave them what they wanted, they would then say, what would you play on this? 
how would you translate this? But it took a while for me to get there in the, you know, on the scene uh, before that was even the first question that, that, before that was even the third question that came out of the, the artist or producer's mind. You know, they'd see me on the gig and I'd be playing a lot of genres and styles and mimicking a lot of drummers and they say, wow, okay, I'm going to call you to do this. I'm going to call you to do this. And I was kind of just hopping around on a lot of things, which ultimately, you know, makes my sound, but they gave me eventually the platform and the space. <clears throat> How do I transition from one to the other? Um, one gig in particular, I remembered because I didn't really have a sound. I had a sound, but you know, as a kid, if you listen to old videos or audio of you yourself talking, you hear you now that you've established yourself, but at the time you're kind of either just repeating phrases, words, or you're just reacting. And um, I was on this gig, this rehearsal. Um, it was for Divine Brown. We had, um, you know, Dave Soulfingers Williams on keys. We had um, Ricky Tilo on guitar, Calvin Beal on bass. And we were at Soundcheck warming up, doing our thing. And then so the guys got to me and they're like, hey, uh, play like Buddy Rich. It's like, okay. Play like Dennis Chambers. I was like, cool. Vinny. Weckle. Max Roach. Gene Krupa. Right, there's going down the list. Calvin Rogers. Now play like Larnell Lewis. And I froze. Oh, crazy. I, I, didn't even, I didn't even know what that meant. So I think... They said, that's your homework now. You got to know what that means. And I said, okay, I, I got to figure out what that means. Um, so I tried to figure it out, which was a very th difficult thing to do when you don't have people to reflect back to you what that means. Um, what that looked like was recording myself, as you mentioned earlier, on gigs, um, you know, and listening to when I did contribute something, what was the response and knowing what that was in real time, YouTube now. Once YouTube hit and people started to cover what it was that I was doing, I started to hear back a little more of what was being translated, you know, from these records and things that I was doing. So there's a lot of different ways that, you know, you mentioned people doing the Larnell thing, and I never really understood what that was. I was like, that doesn't sound like me. How's that the Larnell thing? I thought I, thought I clearly knew what the Larnell thing was, but as the creator or the first listener, as some people would say, um, you know, I'm hearing these ideas and I'm putting them through my filters and I'm pushing this music out. And so I think eventually I started to realize that it was about how I heard music, how I put the music through the filter, my technique, my drum sound, um, and my access to reaction time that really built what it is that people would call the Larnell sound today. So it's interesting reaction time. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful answer. Uh, beautiful thoughts here. Um, okay. I'm, I think I want to talk about Weckl cause I, this is going to be slightly out of order though. Um, um, cause I feel like, I feel like Weckl to me signifies like this leap in in the way drumming was was understood, even though Gad and we have what led up to, I think, the Weckl thing. But what Weckl did, at least for me, and I was a kid when I got the Electric Band record and it changed my life. I mean, I also took a couple lessons from Rick Grattan. So he gave me kind of a window in on how, what was going on there. And so through that, like I abandoned rush i abandoned anything rock related because all of a sudden what i was hearing to me felt like the absolute pinnacle of where drumming was at and and you might as a scholar and and have a deeper understanding but i sort of see weckle as this like epoch like he influenced so many people um he kind of re-elevated the drums to a point that frankly i probably for a lot of years would have said that's it like there's no innovation left in the sport Fast forward to the Instagram and YouTube era, there are more super drummers on my Instagram feed than I ever thought was gonna be possible to have on one planet at one time. Um, it almost feels like there's not a huge amount of musical outlets for these super players. Um, and there's super guitar players, there's super drummers, there's super musicians out there. Um, 
I guess I'm working towards, okay. So then I started the Mark Giuliana thing to me was like, holy smokes. I mean, there's Brian Blade in there too, who sort of uh, is, is sort of recapitulates or, 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 or redesigns drumming from this place of pure soul, pure, pure joy, pure goodness, but also with a, a flow that is peerless maybe. Mm. Um, but then I look at Giuliana as somebody who t sort of took the Weckl thing, tore it apart and rebuilt it in a way that was like mathematic Lego, almost non-musical, but for musos, like to me, I went through a, a few years where I obsessed over Giuliana. So here we are in the internet era with drummers who are so good. What, what are, what are, where are we at? What, because I know you're in the drumming thing. I want to get there eventually too. But the whole internet thing, these, these, the the proliferation of of virtuosity out there. Are there gigs for these people? Are these people looking for gigs? Um, what, uh, you know, I'm an old man who was raised under a version of what I thought my dream life was going to be as a as a drummer who was going to move to Toronto and play on records, and now I see that there seems to be thousands of kids who play. 50 times better than me. I don't know. I can only assume that they learned the Purdy shuffle because they could see it up close. You know, I had to kind of like, I had to, I had to lift it off of records. And if I could catch a glimpse of a video of somebody maybe playing it, maybe I could glean something there. But for the most part, like I was pretty much on my own. Um, I'm not getting to a direct question, but this big concept of musicians when I was a kid played on records. Musicians now are on Instagram is, am I out to lunch? Am I sounding old and ridiculous? I think that, um, first of all, um, I, this is a great conversation piece and I don't think I've had a chance to speak on this publicly yet. So I'm really excited about it. Um, and if I could backtrack to, I love, I love Mark Juliana oh. and, and I, and I feel like, um, you know, I think about him, um, playing with, uh, oh my gosh. Meldow? Meldow and um, the bassist. Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm hearing the records in my mind. And uh, the bassist, he has the same name as a trumpeter, but he's more known. He's incredible. You know, a not lot of stuff. No, not LaFave Upright. Okay. But I'll come, it'll come, it'll come okay, back okay. to me later. But basically, just hearing that music and, and even getting to understand more that you know, what Juliana was, was drawing on, whether it was like, you know, dub music, right. Rock music, um, jazz, his touch. There's so much to his, his sound and the way that he packaged it to become such a unique, um, institution yeah. on the, on the, on the Avenue or on the street of drumming, you know, and it's just, it's incredible. And so when I think about Mark and, how I found out about him, it was through people lending me records or, you know, lend, giving me, hey, check this album out. So I'm on my way to college, to Humber College, and we're listening to these albums on the way there. I'm at school and I have my Discman, I'm listening to it. You know, I have not seen Mark live yet. And so I think just the way that music was absorbed at that time was very different. Um, I heard in the same conversation, that um, interview that Jacob did, at one point, listening to music sorry at one point listening to music with a visualizer was enough right you had like the windows visualizer that was going and that was enough stimulation at the time <clears throat> um i think as we continue in in a direction of um you know information in a variety of ways whether it's you know watching an interview and having a backdrop with a certain kind of lighting you know having um, interviews with, with, you know, more with video, uh, all the things that we're doing. I think that the way we take information in uh, is just, it's a new ground level for people. So I think hmm. back to the influences I had, um, oh my gosh, um, I want to make sure I say his name right. Um, James Newton Howard, are you familiar? Mm-mm. So he's a film composer, but he actually had a record that he had done with some of the Picaro brothers, mm. um, Jeff Picaro being on drums. And um, Yamaha gave him a bunch of keyboards. It was like early 90s, maybe even late 80s, and said, make a record. And so they would just went in studio, and it was just all these keyboard 
flute and drums and percussion. And I grew up on that record. You know, that's if you go and listen to that, you will hear quite a bit of, you know, that sound. And I, that really matured me because that it was that. And then on the other side, it was like, you know, some kind of like Benny Goodman esque type sounding mm. jazz. So I bring all that up to say that when I think about drummers in this day and age that are coming up, my experience in church was that drummers were exposed to high level drumming because we would have concerts every weekend. Mm. We'd have Sunday service. We'd have rehearsals. Our parents are in the choir. So they're bringing us and we're sitting around the drums because one, we're excited Two, it's the cheapest babysitting you'll get. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you, you have this, this understanding of music. And, and for us, it was, you know, happening at such a young age and playing at such a high level. So I could relate to the ability of the young musicians. And I think it's just a little bit different because they don't always have the atmosphere expected when you learn that kind of music, right? When you learn at that level and that pace. So there are monstrous drummers that are at like four, five, six, seven, eight, even three. And I think they're popping up everywhere because they have access to sounds and to music. Um, do they have gigs? I don't know. But I think that the phone is their stage. And that's kind of part of it, right? It's that generation and who knows where we're going. But I really believe that at some point there is a reckoning. Huh. At some point there is an understanding and a connection with what you believe music is for and its purpose. And for some people, they meet it when they're at church. They meet it when they go to that first show, when they go to the 10th show. They meet it when they, they need music, when they're in such a terrible place and music is there to, you know, uh, to, to support them as a form of escapism. Who knows? But I think that there's a moment where you got to meet that place. And I think for a lot of people, because our phones are in our hands and we can see this, and it is like a stage, um, they're building their technique. They're building their performance abilities. But I, I would hope and I, I do believe that they got to meet up with purpose at some point. You know, I don't think it just stays with the phone. I don't think it just stays with the Internet. And I think it's something that will find them when they're ready for it. And when they are ready for it, could you imagine what that would sound like and what that would feel like when they can connect, you know, more purpose? Mm. I mean, you can have fun. You can be in it. You know what I'm, And I'm not saying that there isn't enough purpose in that because just doing something you enjoy alone can bring so much and, and change so much of your physical, physical composition, right? But I think for what music has the power to do, and it's probably already doing it for the generation, but I think there are deeper levels that people have experienced. And I think they'll get there when they're supposed to get there, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's non-judgmental. It's very, it's, it's, it's a position to me, it sounds like of openness to a possible future. Like I have nothing against like musician living through this like time of great athleticism. To me, it's like, um, I like sport for that reason. Like I like high achievement. I like seeing people do things at the absolute best. So like I'm not intimidated or in any way like afraid. I'm I'm just an old man who grew up thinking I was going to be a Dave Weckl one day and get gigs. And now I see there's a million Dave Weckls out there. And I just wonder, is that what a kid still wants is a gig? Or Ooh. does a kid want to get famous on Instagram? I think... So many parts to this. Okay. Um, Jason Marcellus mm -hmm. I had a conversation with him and we were talking about, you know, jazz and why it's not as popular. And he very simply just said, it's not playing on the airwaves as much anymore. So people aren't drawn to it as much. It's not as attractive anymore. And then I think about what people are getting into now. And I, I really believe that, you know, being famous on Instagram is a thing. It's a desire. It's a job. There's, you know, money. You can support your family this way. And it is a career move, ultimately. So, yeah, I think people are definitely gunning and aiming for being on Instagram and being on YouTube and being a creator. So much so that we're now seeing 
like the second generation switch of creators on YouTube who have burnt out and now people are, you know, kind of moving in place for those that have fell out or have burnt out or have decided to take a pause. So I think that being internet famous, being, you know, it, I think it's all, it's all of that. I definitely think it is. I feel like the appetite or the, I think that there's a sophisticated listener out there. I feel like when I saw skinny, as part of me, snarky puppy, not skinny puppy, snarky puppy at, uh, yes. at the MTEL center there at the jazz fest, mm. um, that was 2,600 people. It was packed. It was sold out. And I thought, man, like, they're taking bites from Herbie and Keith and Chick and like putting it in front of a pop audience, more or less. These were normal people. Like it mm -hmm. wasn't like it was a, a room full of jazz sophisticates. Like this was like, and then all of a sudden it was like, man, fusion for this. I believe like there is a hungry musical mind out there in your average person who we have lived through a lot of pop music. And it seems like fusion connects like bad, bad, not good. And at least from what I can tell, even Snarky Puppy, like th these are household names. These bands are famous in the way that, you know, Return to Forever could play a hockey rink back in the 70s. Like it almost feels like there has been a rebirth in fusion in that way. A am I perceiving that right? Absolutely. I think, you know, a, a rebirth in, I, I would even just say a rebirth in, um, in live performance. You know, for for you could say fusion, um, but I've been seeing some incredible young musicians that are taking up the mantle with just traditional jazz alone. Right. You know, even in Toronto, um, and so I think that uh, this this understanding and experience with like feeling live music and being in front of people making mm. sounds and performing, I, I think it's uh, it's it's definitely different to to what was happening before, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a rebirth. It's, I think everyone's just finding it for themselves and snarky, you know, we push and I, what's really cool. You mentioned the drum, the drummer is the, um, there's a very specific word you used. And I think it was more just like the, the flashier kind of aesthetic, well, the showpiece. Yeah. The showpiece. Yeah. Of the band. And, you know, when you think about going to a show, and seeing a band actually do that and you may not know what's happening but you know it's really exciting and it's driving you and and it's it's making you get hype and you're around other people that maybe do know what's happening and you kind of see them moving and you're taking it all in and i think it's just like a really huge experience and then you bring other people so um another cool thing you mentioned about snarky with the headphones yeah. right on these recordings and again you see people enjoying this music live so what happens? You're like, man, I want to be there. Yeah. I want to I want to be with the headphones. I want to sit in the gym. I want to see this happen in front of my face, too. Then you go and you look at the concert. You're like, oh, they really do this live. There's like a whole hour and a half of them actually, you know, doing this in real time. I got to go and see this. And so, yeah, wherever you meet it, I think it's a really, really interesting thing to see. So, yeah, I would say definitely a rebirth. I've got an idea I want to hit you with. I was, uh, uh, you know, a husky kid, as it were. Uh, my mom made me very aware that, you know, I, you know, I needed to eat a little less and probably go outside a little more. Um, but so having that relationship with my body through the years of wanting to be a great musician culminates at a point in my sort of 30s where I'm starting to look at energy. I'm starting to look at how energy starts to leave the body or leave as you get older, you start to realize that some of the iconic drummers that we grew up with, you know, especially from the rock and roll era, you had to play at a level of energy. Some of these guys even died, you know, doing it, you know, and it's like, okay, so they're the, the benchmark. This is, and this goes back in some ways to the idea of the drummer needs to sound dangerous. Cause I sort of feel like that's, that's the brand in rock and roll. If the drummer's not sounding dangerous, then there's a problem with the fundamental architecture. So, I look at drummers in energy. I look at drummers in their bodies. I think about my body. I think about my convex belly as opposed to a concave belly. I start to look at other drummers who have like the veins in their necks and veiny arms. And like, I start to look at energy and body shape and who's got a metabolism that can kick. And I guess in my later years, I sort of feel like one of the things I need to shore up is as a player, 
I have to go and find that a little bit of extra energy to sell the young feel of what I'm doing because my body naturally wants to be lazy, you know, but mm. I feel like my role as a musician from an athletic point of view is to push against that body want to be lazy because that's my metabolism speaking its truth. Now, I think within the context of that, I think that my, I look at Bonham, who was my main guy as a kid, and I look at a body, he's got my body shape. He's got long arms, he's got a belly, and he hits a certain way. It's very sexy, but that body is kind of, to me, you don't produce that sound without that body. I remember after seeing Keith Jarrett play, I saw Jack Dijonette at a bar later. You know, he sits so high on his stool, I thought that he was seven feet tall, but he's a smaller man. And his cymbal attack and the general attack from drums when you sit up high, when you start to pull drums apart like this, this is kind of where I sit now, sort of having been a drum obsessive for my entire life. The energy thing, the physicality thing, the, am, am I, Am I sounding crazy to you or is this interesting to you? Definitely interesting to me. I mean, I've had to find my people um, because similarly, when you watch someone on a screen, on TV, on a phone, on a computer, you unless you really understand drum sizes, and even at that point, you can't really tell um, all the time what's happening. Uh, you Just the way they posture themselves behind the drums or in front of the drums uh, gives you a, a perspective on how you think they might be or look. And the person for me I really connected with was Omar Hakim. Wow. And um, Omar for me, you know, was important because I I wasn't sure how a lot of the drummers were getting their power and it looked like they were sitting really close to the kit, but I couldn't sit that close comfortably. And then I saw Omar. Actually, I met him when I was 14. I went to one of his drum clinics um, and then went to, to sign, get a drum head signed at Drummer's Choice. Cool. Right? At the time. And um, and I was standing there, you know? And at, about at age of 14, I was like almost six foot. Right? <laughs> so I was I was pretty... Was, no, I was definitely six foot. And, and Omar, you know, being the height as well. And so getting to see him and then ha kind of understanding, wow, like, that's the way he sits. That I'm looking at his photos... I'm looking at his videos and I'm, I'm like trying to identify, you know, how to move around the kit because I had to learn really early on that my body, I have really long arms. Like, you know, my wingspan is like seven foot. My arm is my, my arms and I get shirts are like 36, 37, right. For the sleeve. Um, for anyone that wants to surprise me with a shirt. Ah. Um, but, <laughs> but I, I had to understand what it meant for my body type to move around the kit and see examples and then look at others and understand, okay, the way that they set the kit up, the way that they move around the kit works for them, but I can maybe do a version of that so that I, I can also achieve the same facility. So yeah, definitely not crazy talk. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a list of drummers even. I mean, I feel like I, I'm going to take your all, I, we're going to have to trim some of this down, but um, Omar was on the list of like, again, this, this period of drummers that I sort of see from the 80s. I mean, Omar is a pop drummer on those David Bowie, like on Let's Dance, like the power and intention in every snare fill, like the feeling of sort of like that reverse reverb that goes into every hit, like you can feel the wind of the stick coming. Mm -hmm. Like there's something about Omar playing pop that is, I mean, I, I'm sure you'd obsessed over the Bring on the Night video like we all did and then there's the um the solo that's played on uh burn for you yes where we watch that to me was one of the that was a video among the videos that i could personally get within my sort of reach it was at the library you know and i could get that and i could obsess over how did that guy flow you know even listening to omar on the uh the dream of the blue turtles album like to me it was the perfect that era, late 80s into the early 90s, you know, Peter Gabriel, when these super drummers started to play on pop albums, all of a sudden we heard fusion instincts and musicality at a high level being sort of wedged into a pop context. I feel like there we still had sophisticated wants back then, but, um, you know, Manu, these guys who were bringing fusion into pop, like for us kids who were drummers, like that to me was... 
Did you see those people as the way into a, like, I guess I thought that's the job I want. I want to be one of those guys who's got all chops, but then can lay down that thing that's, you're an official contributor to like the voice of popular culture at that point. I, I, I can't help but feel like Omar Akeem has influenced drummers unknowingly because of his ubiquity, like, and how hot his thing was and how in some ways he's not a Chambers, he's not a Weckle. We don't refer to him in that, like, where he moved the whole drumming world in one big step, but something about him dynamically, like I still, I still dream of being an Omar, you know? Yeah. No, even though, you know, Omar for me, what he represented and represents is somebody who has grace and style has a very clear understanding of of music from a harmonic perspective, melodic perspective, and even what it means to back up someone that sings because he sings, right? And so to know what he has to do to play and sing backgrounds, or even him doing those tours with Madonna playing drums, or even, I think, playing bass on some of those tours as well. And so to me, his understanding of music, the way that he had to you know, get movement going, but still having access to fire, and I think that goes back to something I was saying earlier, which was understanding how to do things in your particular way, because the thing has to get done. We got to have the recklessness or we have to have that energy. And he just knew how to do it in such a smooth way that did not disrupt what was going on in terms of everyone pushing. Yeah. But it still just gave so much more energy that it kind of pushed everyone kind of into that mock speed zone, like mm-hmm. one level further every time, you know? You talk about the Procaro brothers. I feel like Jeff Procaro has whiffs of punk coming off of everything he plays. His like, he's so cheeky, despite mm-hmm. the clarity and precision. Like you tell, again, this is the metabolism idea to me. Like he just seems like a high strung, precocious LA, like, jackass you know i don't i don't i know he's probably not a jackass, but you know what i mean like that punk thing like he his aggression his he muscled through like that boss gag stuff in a way that was like we're listening to punk spirit but filtered through a deeply dynamic and well-tuned machine do you agree Mm -hmm. absolutely and i mean i wish i knew him personally i've only heard you know yeah things about his personality and even like when it comes time to stand up for himself in, in terms of like, you know, what was going to happen in studio based on what he wanted for his own personal legacy. You know, I think, I think that fire is something that existed in him and he figured out how to channel it, but as a drummer and having that energy and you see, you mentioned the cheekiness. Um, yeah. Like I think that to me, what Jeff represents is, someone as a, a session musician who who's not afraid to lean in to certain things, you know, cause I, you, you get in studio and like we talked about earlier, you, you got to play a role, right? You, you got to play a part. You got to be a character in this thing. And I think he just knew how to be that character regardless of his, you know, who he was or whatever it could have been. But like, yeah, he knew how to play that character and to just push the music. Like I, I just, as a drummer, I really believe while, you know, you could be really mild mannered or chill or whatever it is, you still have to understand that the music needs in order to to connect with people, there's gotta be some kind of a spark. You know, and the spark doesn't have to always be loud, you know? The spark could be something that's just a very gentle flame. Mm. It turns into a gentle flame. Mm. But you gotta ignite something. Mm. And so I think a lot of drummers that really know how to move people, they know how to ignite their situation and they know how to control the flame and not torch the, uh, the s'mores, so to speak, you know, like they know how to just live at whatever is necessary. Um, a slow burn, a slow burner is, um, Brian blade when he's ready, you know, he can just simmer, and then when it's necessary, just the flame just kicks up so high and has this beautiful kind of like 
you know, fireworks aesthetic to it with the sparks. And Steve Gadd's another one who knows how to really create such a level of warmth from the fire he creates and has sparked that he could heat a whole village <laughs> with just this fire, you know? This is what I mean about your philosophical approach. Like, you're using language, um, a dynamic language, a visual language, that there's a reason why we feel what you're playing from behind the kit. You have this vast visual landscape that you're drawing from that makes huge amount of sense to me. This is how I see drumming and music as well. And maybe that's just about when you get into the depths. Um, and when you do start to get lost in the, not lost, but when you do start to indulge that philosophical um, side, it is a way to kind of move into a deeper relationship. I had heard from one interview, you had said that you were imagining light coming off the shoulder of your stick. Um, yes. Because that helped you sort of reposition your attack on the cymbals. And to be honest with you, hitting the drums to make them sound good is like a, a personal, it's a personal, it's it's one of my personal obsessions. Because like, you can hit the drums and they can sound bad. You can hit cymbals and they can sound really bad. And I'd even heard you talk about being able to realize when you're in a certain room, how those cymbals are bouncing off the walls. Now I got to attack the things differently because the room is reacting differently. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about this visual thing, this light coming off the stick, the shoulder of the stick, because that kind of blew my mind. Yeah. So um, I'll use uh, this one. Yeah. So <clears throat> basically with the drumstick, when I talk about the light off the stick, um, what I had thought often about was you're told hit the, cent hit the center of the drum. So immediately you think hit the center of the drum uh, with what? The stick. The stick tip. Okay, I'm going to hit the center, right? Now, when I hit the center of the drum, if you look at my hand with the stick, a lot of the motion is happening from the wrist. That's good. That's fine, right? That's comfortable. I'm also, you know, for anyone looking at this, I'm I'm choosing to play middle finger fulcrum as opposed to kind of like the standard, you know, pointer finger fulcrum. Yep. I feel like I can get more resonance out of the stick hmm. as a striker. And it also helped because I had a lot of injury. And, and so that was one of the things that I um, had done to be able to play a lot longer. So tip of the stick into the drum. Now, if I imagine a beam of light here, right, as a visual aid, I would just be pointing that into the head, which means that anything that my hand is doing right now with the stick, this hand is acceptable because I'm hitting this mark. If I put the light of beam as a guide right around here, and I think hit with the tip of the stick, but think about this side of the stick, now hmm. my focus is in a different, very different place. And if you look, what's happening to my technique, right? If I think tip of the stick, if I think a little further down into the shoulder where the taper is kind of before it really gets aggressive, now my form and technique are changing, right? I'm using more of my forearm. There's still some wrist action, mm. but I'm leaning more into the drum. So there's this versus this. I feel like you, I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a slightly lower fundamental. I get it. Yeah. I, feel, I almost understand it from a gut level. Like, yeah. So, so once I kind of made that connection, then I started going around the drums with a very different, um, a, a different, a very different like swing of my arm, you know, because I was taught, you know, you got to swing your arm this way, but I would do it and then I would, would throw all that energy away and yeah. just trying to nail, you know, the tip. So it's like, I'd almost pull the stick back yeah. in a sense. But when I figured that I can change my, my focus, just imagining a, a bit of light here as a guide. Now I'm putting so much more into the drum and I'm getting this deeper, lower, even as I swing in the air, um, I feel like I'm, I'm putting more energy that's in a lower frequency and I'm going to get that back from the drums. Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know. We could go. I, I mean, I'm going to, we're going to wrap up soon. And, um, uh, you've been very generous and I'm, this is fascinating. This is exactly what I wanted to 
this chat to be. Let, let's in 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 we'll wrap up with talking about Drumeo if you don't mind. Um, of course, I wanted to talk about Enter Sandman, but my guess is you've probably talked a lot about Enter Sandman. <laughs> talk about Drumeo, and I'd also like to hear about Flowfest if you don't mind. Um, yeah. So and, go ahead, and I'll, and I'll we'll do Drumeo Flowfest, and there's one more thing I want to yeah, throw please. at you afterwards. Yeah. So yeah, so Drumeo. Go so ahead. Drumeo, like okay, so it's a, this is a Canadian company. Canadian company. Like. I, I, I met some Drumeo kids when I was playing on the outskirts, uh, like some small city uh, outside of Vancouver. So I'm guessing it's like, is it in? Abbotsford. Know, Abbotsford. Okay. So I think that's where I was actually playing, where I met some. I mean, it feels like these Drumeo people are moving the needle. Like, it feels like this is a worldwide thing. Is this a Canadian concept? Is this built by Canadians? This is a Canadian business? Absolutely. Um, Jared Falk. Um, and, uh, Dave, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm forgetting your last name. And Jared Falk is I the just, kid who goes and meets all the drummers and, uh, who's the kid who, who's, who's the guy I see on, on YouTube all the time. He sets his kid up. He, he, he learns all. Oh, Brandon Taves. Brand, yes. Okay. Brandon Taves. So, Brandon, so, so there's Brandon, but before Brandon, yep. um, there was like Mike McCalco, um, Dave, who goes by Drumio Dave and, um, Jared Falk and Jared Falk and Dromeo Dave specifically started Dromeo and it used to be called freedrumlessons.com. That was the website, okay. right? And they would rent a studio and they would teach these, you know, these very rudimental lessons, um, specific things, technique, um, how to play this beat, how to play that beat. And it was just a free, it was a free resource to anyone that needed to know um, how to get around that music. They started making their own um, packaged uh, lessons, right? Content that was available so you could buy these DVDs and um, just kind of have it and go through the, the material as you please. And then they started transitioning to doing online lessons through YouTube um, and then starting to do live lessons with drummers that were in the industry. And then that's the model that's caught fire and has really taken them all the way. Okay, because it looks like a huge business. It, it seems very exciting. So what, you're sort of, you're in, you're with Drumeo, or what's your connection to Drumeo? So my, my connection is I'm a Drumeo coach, which means um, I've put content on, on their platform, on their website. I've done live lessons. Um, and I've been with them as more of a special guest since 2012. That's a long time because it's to me, it's more on my radar in the last few years, but it's so it's not been an overnight success. It's been a slow build and it's very mm. fascinating. I like it just seems like it's taking over the world somehow or other. And maybe that's just my perception. My YouTube algorithm shows me a lot of Drumeo, but it feels like they're getting inside the heads of a lot of the most important drummers that kind of ever were. And and they seem to have kind of the they got the market locked on it a bit. Absolutely, you know, and uh, Musora is now the company, and they've spread out, and they have uh, Pianote, and Guitario, and Recordio, and they have like all these platforms where they bring in specialists of those instruments to do a similar thing based on the Drumio model. Um, but it, they are a staff of over a hundred people, I believe, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even more. Um, and, and their vision and foresight and understanding and desire to boost the drumming community for people, regardless of their level. Like if you mm -hmm. wanted to just be better at, you know, um, just playing along to songs at home, that's it. That's cool. You could live your dream as a drummer, experience these things and get into the language. And it's, it just makes drumming and the community of drummers so much more accessible outside of going to um, drummerworld.com and seeing the setups and hoping that the band comes to your to your city and like you know like it's just it's so much more accessible than DVDs like it's it's a really great time. Okay, let's talk about um, your festival, uh, the Flow yes. Fest. So Flow Fest, uh, you know, which is co-curated by myself and my wife Joy Joy Laps. And uh, we put this together in conjunction or alongside Brampton, the city of Brampton and Rose Theater, which was a, a great initiative they started because they wanted to, you know, highlight the world of drumming. And because I'd lived in Brampton for a while, uh, they asked me to join them. And so we programmed, we connected with our people 
And one of the biggest things for us is to not only highlight drummers, but also highlight drummers that are composers as well, mm. which is a really important thing to me and an important thing to join. So yeah, it happens every September. Okay, cool. Which is great. This is the third um, year coming up September 21st. I love that. Um, okay, I said there was only going to be two things. And you want, want you want to talk about one more thing, but can I, can I squeeze in one more thing? Yeah, Canadian man. drummers. So, you know, you were on the cover of Modern Drummer magazine. I, I'm not sure... I know Pat Stewart was just on the cover of Modern Drummer. I'm not sure how many Canadians have ended up on the cover. It feels like that was a glass ceiling to break through for sure. Um, can we just talk about Canadian drummers in the Toronto drummer scene? I know we're this is real. This is real. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, behind baseball or whatever. Like I know some of my some folks listening to this are gonna be like, "Oh man, I got I can't deal with this anymore." But I, you, this is this nerd. This is who I am. This is my nerdy thing. So, um, the Humber scene. You know, when I first went to Toronto in the '90s, like Humber was bad mouthed on the Queen Street and Strip because it was like it was a lot of people I think dressed up like cowboys playing Telecasters, being pretty intimidated by these cats at Humber who were killing it. So, mm. you know, I, because I was a Queen Street kid, like I had to kind of like ride the line of like not outing myself as like a total drum nerd and trying to be cool with, you know. But there's a scene, like there's a Canadian drummer scene that was very interesting to me. And there's some of my favorite drummers are Canadian and because they played on Canadian records and played on records that really meant a lot to me. But it does feel like, so is it Sarah Thayer? How do you pronounce Sarah's last oh, name? Oh, yeah, Thauer, yes, Sarah Thauer. So to me, it's, her, her trajectory is fairly, is very fascinating. And she, did she have to leave Canada and go to LA to do the thing she's doing? Like, would we? Would she be that household name at if she hadn't? Do you think she was that household name before she, she went? She to was LA. okay. Yeah. So she had done um, VF jams for Vic Firth. I think I don't remember if she was there in LA by the time the Zildjian Live happened. But I really felt that she wanted more from what was available to her, mm -hmm. and it. It is available to her. And I think if it's available, why not go and get it? You know, why, Fantastic. why not just, you know, attach yourself to it? So, but yeah, no, she was, I, I remember, you know, um, seeing her come up on the scene and the conversations we would have. And she's just a powerhouse. She's like, her knowledge and understanding is incredible. And so I think it was just a matter of time for people to understand the dedication and uh, for her to get the platform to be able to to showcase what it is that she is. A hundred or 200 years ago or so, I was taking a drum lesson um, with my drum teacher at Deerhurst in Huntsville. That's where I grew up. Now, mm. there was a Vegas show there that was on, and it might still be on. It was decades and decades and decades. And at the time in the 70s and 80s, it was a big deal, um, you know, moneyed people would holiday at Deerhurst and see the Vegas show. And it was how, so I took lessons from the drummer in that show at Deerhurst. There was a bar where my drum, where my drum teacher had an old set of Pearl electronic drums set up to play mm. dance music in the bar. Well, it turned out there was a guy in the Vegas show whose son was turning out to be quite a phenomenal singer songwriter and kind of I think sort of pulled a few strings and got him a gig in the bar downstairs. They were sound checking after my lesson. So my teacher took me down the elevator and we went and watched the sound check. Now, this was a, a, a collection of the hottest Toronto musicians I'd ever seen. And the guy singing and playing was awfully good, awfully good. And he had like kind of U2 sort of like a big voice thing going mm. on. The sound check is finished and my drum teacher kind of elbows me and goes, this is when the real show starts. So that singer gets behind the kit and starts putting on a Dave Weckl show. Like I'd never seen in real life a, p a person play like that. That was Mark Kelso. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I feel like Mark Kelso, is he really felt in the Canadian drum scene, especially if you've come through Humber? Like how important is this guy? Mark Kelso... Um, if you went to Humber playing any instrument in the last 17, almost 20 years, you would have encountered Mark Kelso. And Mark Kelso stands for a high level of excellence and a standard of awareness. And, you know, 
he is absolutely felt because if you, if you think about that multiplier effect of being in the presence of somebody who is, is so, um, you know, desires so much for the music to, to live and exist at a certain level that rubs off, that trickles off, you know, like it's a standard, like Mark Kelso is a standard. I remember, you know, reading his bio like every week to understand who he was playing for and what gigs he was on and just trying to like wrap my brain around who he was on the scene and then getting a chance to sub for him, you know, and then get taking lessons with him and then also working alongside him at Humber. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, to me, he's so massive when it comes to education, but also again, as a standard of a sound, like I remember people would jokingly say, you know, when I got to a session, they're like, Hey man, if you can't cut it, you know, we're going to get, we got Kelso on the line. Like, it's okay. Like we'll, we will grab, you know, we'll grab, we'll, we'll call, we'll call Mark. <laughs> and so, um, I, <laughs> to me again, it's it, to he's like, he's the standard, you know, and has been for so long, um, hearing how he would, be at certain sessions or playing at the blue note in Toronto or, you know, playing behind this artist or needing to do this thing or arranging this music or it's just, it's just, there's just so much. So yeah. Yeah. He is massive on the scene. Okay. That's interesting. All right. You said you wanted to talk about one more thing and then I'm going to let you go. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to highlight my upcoming record, Yes, which is cool. And so my album is called slice of life. Um, and it really is highlighting my experience as a dad and, um, you know, some stories about what this transition into this new phase of life is going to be. It's getting released on March 22nd, which is my 40th birthday. Oh, Yeah. And so um, it's really exciting because they're all new compositions. I'm collaborating with new musicians as well as my my band that we've been touring this music for the last couple of years. And um, it's all composed and produced by me, which is the first time. And um, it's a little bit of a different angle on my uh, front-facing drumming side in that um, it is about the compositions. It is about the stories. I've actually, one of the songs is a lullaby I wrote for my son that's on there. And um, the first thing you hear when you start the record is my daughter asking me to play hide and seek. And so... Um, yeah, it's just really just a sonic representation and a diary entry of what my life has been and what it will be. And it's a transition piece, so to speak, in this catalog and canon of music that I'm going to be releasing. And um, I'm so happy about it uh, that I'm nervous because I'm expecting people to say, oh, man, like, you know, we want more of this and more of that. And I'm like, yes, it is all there, but it also is an important um, moment for me to just say, sit for a second and hear me out. Because when you understand who I am showing you to be, that I'm not the 22 year old anymore. I'm not the 32 year old anymore. You know, this is the 40 year old Larno showing up and saying, you know, here I am. This is what I look like. This is what I sound like. This is what it feels like to be inside of my mind. So I'm really excited about it. I love that. And I love that the, the mission statement is the, the, uh, a check-in in the midpoint of a trajectory. I mean, I watched a Leonard Cohen doc on a flight recently where he talked about wanting to age in front of his audience. And it's a very not rock and roll thing to say, but for people who have the kind of dynamism that you would have where you're going to be in you're going to be making music at a high level for a very long time. It's important, I think, in some ways to showcase what happens in the lifespan of a musician. Mm -hmm. And even what it is, as the ego begins to fade a little when you get older, um, you reprioritize what it is you want to put forward that represents you. Like you said, the 22-year-old Larnell and the 32-year-old Larnell were being informed by a whole different set of circumstances. And the 40-year-old Larnell it's going to have that care, calm, and pause of a middle-aged person mm -hmm. to bring the truth of what it is you're hoping to be or, or trying to get across. It's a very beautiful thing. I very much appreciate the sentiment because I think that 
you know, I'm 49. I, I turned 49 two days ago. And oh, like, amazing. Happy belated. Thanks. Uh, and happy pre 22nd. Does that put you in Pisces or are you just out of Pisces? Cusp of Aries, so I'm Aries. Okay. Um, I love... I love a long trajectory. I, I, I feel like it was touring Europe and noticing the legacy artists that still get huge props in Europe. I remember I was touring Europe a lot those days and feeling like, man, this audience has a longer loyalty narrative to their artists than in North America where sometimes an artist can disappoint us once and we flush them. You know, it's like, that's it. Mm. They blew it once and they're, I'm done with them. Whereas that European thing is they seem to hang with an artist for a longer period. It's like, if I trusted you once, I might trust you again at a later date, even if what you're giving me today isn't exactly what I was hoping for. I also do think that in a long artist's life, it's important to disappoint your audience. I feel like you have to remind everybody who's in control a little bit. And it's your wants and wishes that are first and foremost. Once you start chasing the wants and wishes of your audience, you lose yourself quickly and it's hard to mm. find yourself again. That's my feeling anyways. Mm -hmm. No, I hear that. And, and, <clears throat> and I really think that, uh, cause I've inserted the music here and there and, and really changed and catered the, the experience in a live show to partially storytelling, just because like it, the stories are so deep you know, for this, for this music, I mean, you know, so deep, <laughs> all my kids, um, they, they all get a song each. And so, um, you know, my son who is seven this year in December, I don't know how much you know about him online or, or seen much, but he was actually born with a condition called trisomy 21 which is down syndrome and so he's with trach and g-tube he's nonverbal. um in fact he's being discharged from the hospital today he went in for like uh, a few days uh, i think it was like as of tuesday and so while existing in this world as a professional musician i'm also navigating being dr dad and navigating what it means to see this really fragile situation but knowing that i have to leave town to still provide for my family or mm. to go, you know, and teach at a college or to be in my studio and record and do what I got to do. Maybe, you know, waiting for them to start, stop running around upstairs. And, um, that experience was so heavy. You know, I, I, once he was born, I didn't play drums for two months, mm. which is a really long time for me. And, um, my first gig back was playing Kerner hall. And my second gig back was playing, um, Carnegie Hall with Snarky Puppy. And so just with how heavy my heart was at the time and, you know, just living life. But then also having my daughter who is, you know, when she was three, we called her a three major because she's just so wise but beyond your years and you can't get much past her, um, you know, right to our child that we're going to be expecting this summer, which is great. And so, so many experiences that we've had with our kids. And I think that the, because music is highlighting and reflecting the times for me, I think it was just important to put these stories together and allow people to understand that while you might see me playing, there's a person behind the drums, you know, there's a mm -hmm. person behind the music and you might be struggling or you might be dealing or you might have a lot going on, but you don't have to forsake music is really what it is i'm saying you know you don't have to let music go in order to like maybe for a time but there's something healing about music and there's something about the expression and even just being able to sit down and play for yourself not for a gig mm. not for a recording not for music that people need to hear but for you to entertain yourself and for you to heal yourself and for you to shed whatever it is that was happening and so that's to me the purpose of this and it's such a deep record for me and so deep that it took me a while to accept that this was just i, I had to do this before i did anything else mm. i have to put this out once that's out we move on but it's so heavy on my heart and in my mind and i love it so much and um and i talk about these moments in this in the show and I look forward to to having more conversations with people to really get into just what life looks like. Hmm. 
Larnell, thank you for this. I'm so thank grateful. Uh, it's been an honor. Like I said, I was starstruck just seeing you on my, come up on my laptop here. I'm very grateful. Uh, bless you. More power to you going forward. Um, thank you. All the blessings to you and your family and congrats on your career. And it's a real, um, yeah, it's really inspiring. I'm very grateful for the chat and thank you so much. Thank you for making this space and, and, and having this amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you soon. Definitely too, man. Bye. Bye. The Stumble Forward is an Isadora Media production and is hosted by Hoxley Workman and produced by Jennifer Cavanaugh. Be sure to subscribe and follow The Stumble Forward. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash Hoxley Workman. Thank you for listening. Stumble forward. The stars go forward.